Hi, in this chapter, we're going to continue talking about the economics and the environment. And specifically in this video, we'll talk about abatement. And by abatement, all we mean is uh, how much we want to reduce pollution and how do we balance the costs of uh, doing that with the benefits of a cleaner environment. So here we're going to look at climate change specifically and obviously climate change is probably the most important uh, issue that we're facing as you know a species and we want to think about well what are the economic costs of uh, reducing climate change reducing greenhouse gases um, and what are the benefits so here we can see um, a graph showing uh, carbon dioxide parts per million in the atmosphere that's the blue line on the right axis um, and the deviation from uh, the average temperature between the 1960s uh, and the 1980s, so 1961 to 1990. And you can see that they increase. Now, climate science is <laughs> a lot more complicated than this one graph, um, which is good because whenever you see graphs that, you know, both go up or both go down, um, you, you don't necessarily want to take that as causality, but in this case, um, you know, with climate scientists, we can be uh, fairly certain that the increase um, in atmospheric carbon dioxide is what is driving the increase in the temperature. So this is a, a really difficult problem, partially because we need to not only, you know, stop increasing carbon dioxide emissions, we need to start decreasing it as well. Um, and the uncertainty around climate change is uh, such that, you know, the worst case scenario is just super catastrophic. Um, and so we need to think about, all right, well, which situation do we focus on? Do we focus on the most likely outcome? Do we focus on the worst outcome? Um, and one of the main problems is that unlike a lot of pollution, climate change is a global problem, right? It's going to require global cooperation. It's not like a problem of smog that's caused by local, um, you know, industry or, you know, acid rain that's caused by uh, sulfuric acid being put into the air by local power plants. Uh, this is something that requires uh, the entire world to cooperate and one in which uh, countries' interests are very different. And so we'll, we'll have to think about that. So when we think about abatement, uh, we can think about abatement sort of costs and benefits. And so this is one example from the book um, where basically we have different options ranged from uh, most easily done or, or cheapest on the left to most expensive. And then the width of each rectangle is how much uh, carbon dioxide we can get rid of by using them. And so you can see, you know, the cheapest one that has a lot of benefit is reduced slash and burn agricultural conversion. And so this is one way to clear land in order to make it usable for agriculture. Um, but unfortunately, it puts a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is also brings up another point, which we'll talk about in uh, a little bit later in the chapter is, you know, this is done by some of the poorest people in the world. And so how do we help them uh, come up with a better alternative to, um, you know, increase agricultural productivity, right? Which is really what needs to be done. Um, and you can see there's lots of different other options, right? Nuclear sort of stands out here as an option. Um, unfortunately, nuclear costs are, you know, increasing, uh, at least in the United States and the UK. Um, whereas solar, um, which also sort of stand out here, are getting cheaper and cheaper, as is wind. Um, and so there are a lot of options and, you know, they, they, they're going to need the government in order to put some policies into place uh, in order to incentivize them in some cases, right? That's not true of all things. Um, so this is a, an updated graph uh, from the World Resources uh, Institute, and you can see that the right hand side of this graph sort of starting you know about a third of the way over looks very similar to the graph we had on the previous page but there are all these policies to the left that are actually have a negative cost at least in terms of the lifetime of um the 
the policy. And so, you know, just switching from incandescent to LED bulbs was one that is has a negative cost. And the reason it has a negative cost is that over the lifetime of that LED bulb, you save more in energy than it costs to actually buy the bulb, right? And so this is why, you know, we got rid of incandescent bulbs and we're switching all to LED bulbs. Um, light bulbs are relatively cheap, right? Even though you, mean you might have to spend a couple hundred dollars to replace all the light bulbs in your house. That's not a huge expense, whereas, um, you know, replacing all of our cars with hybrid cars or electric cars, that's a much larger expense. Um, and so a lot of these costs, while they do have negative um, costs overall, so they have a positive benefit, uh, do require upfront uh, investment. And that's one of the things we'll talk about uh, as well. So what we want to think about is we want to take, okay, we want to, take all of those technologies that we can use to um, abate, in this case, carbon dioxide, and put them, stack them all together into a, a least cost abatement curve, right? So we have the cheapest over here, then the more expensive ones, and then the most expensive ones. And this is very similar to, you know, a production possibility frontier, um, except here now we have environmental quality, however we want to measure it on the vertical axis, and we have the cost of abatement here on the horizontal axis. And really what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing we did before and flip this curve horizontally uh, in order to get the feasible set. But first, let's look at these three points, right? Point A is feasible, um, but it's more expensive than, say, point A prime, where we get the same environmental quality um, and it's the same cost as a double prime, which gives uh, the um, same cost, but a higher environmental quality. So point A is dominated by both of them, right? It's dominated by everything uh, in this little triangle. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to try to get onto uh, the uh, feasible frontier, right? of the, that line. So this is going to be, we're going to think about this in a very similar way to the way we thought about both uh, consumer uh, utility maximization and firms profit maximization, where we have a feasible frontier. The slope is going to be the marginal rate of transformation. And that's going to come from technology, right? From, you know, the ways that we can reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and then we're going to have some preferences and the preferences are going to be what's kind of complicated here, right? Because we're not talking about, you know, the profit maximization of a single firm or preferences of a single person. We're talking about societal preferences and societal preferences are very hard to measure and often will not agree, right? I might have a different um, preference for environmental quality and cost than you do. The United States might have a different uh, preference than India. Um, and so we have to think about this uh, in a more complicated way. But if we can come up with sort of some ideal indifference curve, right, then the slope there we'll call the marginal rate of substitution, right, how much we're willing to substitute uh, abatement costs, which are going to cost us uh, real resources versus environmental quality. And then the slope of that is the MRS. And again, we'll set uh, the MRS equal to the MRT, and that will be our ideal um, abatement choice, right? And then we'll basically do all of the abatement policies that are cheapest up until that point, and we won't do the ones afterwards. That's the idea. So as we said, the problem is there's a lot of conflicts of interest, right? Who should pay for these costs of abatement? Well, when we think about, you know, factories polluting, power plants polluting, then the polluter pays principle makes a lot of sense, right? Those responsible uh, should pay for the damages. That's often what we have, you know, in the United States. But on a global scale, it may not always be the best policy, right? So some of the polluters are some of the lowest income people in the world who are you know, doing the slash and burn agricultural, um, burning wood for uh, warmth for food, um, it might be better in those cases to for, you know, the rich countries of the world to help them come up with better alternatives um, by, you know, providing some subsidies for new technologies that can 
that will allow them to uh, reduce their carbon emissions and even get, you know, a better technology, a more efficient technology um, that will benefit them as well. So in order, because, because, you know, these benefits are not equally shared, right, as we said, then we have to think about um, how we're going to, to make these trade-offs. Um, and so, you know, we might have the citizens uh, MRS, which is their marginal rate of substitution between the quality of the environment um, and, and costs or benefits and the firm's uh, marginal rate of transformation um, between the cost of the the cost of abatement and, and quality environment. Um, one thing that we often think about in terms of like local pollution or, you know, dangerous jobs is that there's this trade off that people are willing to accept a higher wage for you know, a more dangerous job or a lower environmental quality. Um, I don't think this is necessarily the greatest way to think about it, um, but this is what this graph is saying here. So in this case, you know, you have wages on the horizontal axis and quality environment, um, and the indifference curves here are the citizens indifference curves. Um, and then the red line is the businesses um, sort of ability to, um, you know, increase the environment as a trade-off with wages. Um, and, you know, in various points, people will either be willing to work or not be willing to work. Um, but is this really what's going on? I mean, maybe, but in a lot of places, you know, you you might not have a lot of options as a worker, right? You might grow up in a place where coal mining is, is standard and then you uh, have no other option. That's what you do. And you don't think about, you know, the, the health costs, the environmental costs of doing that. Um, you might not be aware that the uh, local plant is polluting and, and putting carcinogens into the water, into the, the air. Um, so, I think we should take this with a little bit of grain of salt because it, it requires sort of full information, right, uh, for people to make those decisions. And how, you know, even if we have full information, right, a lot of how those get distributed depends on bargaining power. Um, and bargaining power is going to depend on who has the, you know, the property rights, you know, for our businesses allowed to pollute, our people have property rights for clean water and clean air. Uh, it could depend on, you know, lobbying by the firm. And so a lot of this, as I said, I don't think it's the best way to think about it. Um, I think, you know, in terms of abatement, we need to think about sort of the overall social uh, benefits and costs um, and hopefully leave it to, you know, a government entity that has the best interests of the entire country um, in mind, which, of course, is not always uh, realistic uh, in order to make the best decisions.